Okay. So we are all good. Well, welcome everybody to our artist talk with Pauline. We are so glad to have you all here. Um, I am just going to very briefly introduce Pauline. Um, all of you, I think, know her already, but just for a little bit of background info. Um, and then I will let Pauline do her talk and then we'll do questions um, and discussion at the end. So without further ado, let me introduce the dear Pauline. Um, Pauline Betancourt is a French artist and has been living in Aix-en-Provence for the last 20 years. She graduated with an MFA from L'Ecole Supérieure d'Art d'Aix-en-Provence in 2009. In 2007, Pauline was introduced to the Marshoots community. Since then, she has continued to grow both as an artist and an educator under the guidance of John Gasparich, Alan Roberts, and numerous fellow artists. So without any delay, I'll turn it over to Pauline for her talk. Hello, everyone. Bonjour. So I am going to share my screen, if that's okay, with everyone. Okay. And, um, alors, is this working well like that? Okay. Yes, looks good. Okay, good. I'm going to, I'm just keeping this window on the side so I can have a, a little bit of a relationship to an audience. So it makes me feel a little more comfortable. Uh, and then I am going to start. Up. Oh. Is everything good for everyone? Beautiful. Perfect. So, um... Thank you all. What? It's going on Yabama. Pardon. It's not the <laughs> right thing. Up. Oh, I'm sorry. Little technical issue. Up. Oh, nope. Up. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's just go back. You have a little bit of a. Ooh. Okay. Presentation. Activer le mode plein écran. Alors. That's the right one. I'm sorry. Hop. And of course, it doesn't work. I'm sorry. <laughs> Alors, no wait. Need to be sorry. Alors, hop, aperçu. Voilà. Escape. Zoom. It's good. It's going to allow more people to come in. Exactly. We have more people joining every minute. So this is great. great. <laughs> this is all planned. <laughs> it is. Alors, partager. Okay. And now I'm going to go to présentation. Activer le mode plein écran. Okay. Good. Thank you all for being here and thank you to the Leo Marshall School of Painting and Drawing for inviting me to be the artist of the month of March. I was very lucky in 2007 when as an art student, I found this community of artists. I am very grateful for John Gasperich and Alan Roberts, my mentors and my friends, as well as all the artists and supporters of the school dear to my heart. Everything I learned and explored is the result of direct experiences. There is no separation between the, between the theory and the practice, as Leo Marschutz would say himself. Everything in the school is interrelated and operates organically with a great care and respect for each individual's process. The fundamental principles formulated by Leo Marschutz, carried on and protected by his students, are radical in their way to, recon to reconnect someone with their environment, their senses, and to develop their imagination and capacity to see into anything with greater depth, complexity, and humility. I was amused when I first heard John Gasparich quote Yogi Berra's truism, 
the more you look, the more you see. It is very true. Developing my vision and my capacity to see more into the visible world radically changed my practice and continues to do so. Now, what does that mean? After graduating from L'Ecole Supérieure d'Art d'Aix-en-Provence, I felt that my figurative practice of painting and drawing needed a few more foundation, foundations, such as a stronger sense of reality. I used to create a world of images and turn my eyes inward. I worked a lot from imagination and photographic documents, but something was missing, looking outward. I needed to nurture my imagination by working directly from nature and great works of art. Early in my training as an art student, I understood the primordial function of this thing, drawing, in any form of art. In French, dessin, drawing, used also to be spelled like dessin, destiny, and it shared a communality of meaning. So dessin, drawing, and destiny is interrelated, interconnected. And I finally found a group of artists and a school who still believed in the timeless value of drawing and of painting, obviously. By drawing, showing, revealing, this at least 40,000 years old human practice still allows us to engage with a surface to render a vision. It does not get old. In my experience, this utmost expression results in a communion of the hand, sight, spirit, and heart. It demands to engage with the totality of one's being to create another being, not just an image. The attention it requires is a form of love and care. Work on the whole, keep working on the whole, I would hear from Alan. In order to render a vision with coherence, I could not ignore any parts. One piece of advice, that was most life-changing was keep looking for relationships. This advice contains almost everything. It allows infinite truthful observations to give birth to forms from our concrete experiences. Our senses are the primary source of observation. It requires a close attention to what is present to notice values, colors, contrast, similarities, patterns, characters, bringing the whole vision together and creating meaning by selecting what is essential to the work. Looking for relationships allows each artist to pursue what is so particular to their own vision. What I mean by that is how the interior landscape and the exterior landscape form each other. I'm quoting Barry Lopez. This connection is actually what a French neurologist, Lionel Nakache, calls le cinéma intérieur. In brief, there is a constant back and forth between how we see things and how we conceive them. A visual meditation is an experience and meaning is revealed through looking. We use our eyes every day to navigate our world. But when do we use them to look deeply into the phenomenons of life? To stop and appreciate the beauty, the character and mystery of what is not us. This close attention to the visible world and art increases one's sensibility. I noticed that pursuing wholeness, unity, and relationships in my own practice has a profound effect on my life in general. 
I acknowledge a lot more how I react to the world. It creates experiences where my subjectivity is constantly in dialogue with what is other, what is different from me. Yet, there is a communality and it is rendered in my work when I do not fail. The virtue of such dialogue between me and my motifs is to de-center my attention for myself and to open a channel and welcome simultaneously another presence, which has a lot to show and teach me. My best work is rendered through that silent dialogue. It needs space. This is maybe why atmosphere, volume, and depth are a necessity in art, to allow space for that conversation. I do not use words, but colors, values, strokes. Vision precedes words, and je ne sais ce que je vois qu'en travaillant, I only know what I see as I work, as Giacometti said. To better talk about my work, I would like to show you a selection. I will share different steps of my process and we can start a conversation. I will use a few photographs of my motif to give you a context, but you may quickly notice that the photographic vision is very different and it cannot replace what the human eye and imagination can create. How possible it is that, Ugh, sorry, oh gosh. Well, sorry. It is difficult to describe with words what happens, and I don't mean to be obscure on purpose, but the way a piece comes to life or fails to is more related to a visual necessity. What moves me in the first place is literally the definition of a motif. The motif is what codes the movement of my hand and of my whole being. The origin of the motif resides in the configuration that I see. Fellow artists have described me as fencing when I work. My whole body is engaged. It is a very strange dance. The sensibility and character of each, of each stroke needs to be felt entirely. Listening to music is really important to me during these sessions because I use the rhythm and tempo as pulsations and I follow the climaxes. The expansion of music helps me gather the masses and to create the light with vibration and solidity. I discover a group of trees gathered in fellowship. Through their masses and luminosity, each one is revealed as an individual. In their expansion in space, I see a choreography, an imprint of movements evocative of our own. I draw the shadows and sculpt the light with percussive strokes to embody the energy of their relationships. The trees are grounded in the earth, reaching outward, relatively immobile. Immobile. I am pursuing the movement of their growth, fusing their bodies with the density of, of the air. Through the abstraction, the drawing evokes for me countless movement of life forms. The waiting, loving and gathering, battles. Nymphea et feuille morte, Giverny. I saw on the pond a perfect coexistence of a life cycle. In their curves, the dead red leaves have their last moment of vibrance and resistance. They are passing while 
water lilies are blooming. The relationships between strokes, describing curves, arches, vertical blooms, and horizontal rest articulate this constant cycle on the surface of water. A mesmerizing mirror and a passage to another world. A flower is a gravitating life holding everything together. So much gentle strength is in a flower which only lasts a few days. Its color turned into a flame. The luminous effect ignites movement and the whole picture is colors and values fused, painting and drawing fused, incarnating and holding together the forces I sense. In this motif, I see a gathering, something about resilience and resistance, holding to the earth, rising, being innocent again. Why does it do that? Saint Mandrier sur Mer. Painting the sun setting, looking in its direction, has been a recurrent motif for me. It is challenging as it is a brightest light source and I can't look at it directly but I capture glimpses in my peripheral vision. The kind of this kind of motif requires a furtive gaze, quick perceptions, and my memory is a lot more engaged. For these two oil pastels, I chose to work on a cream paper. It sets the tone for a warm setting sun atmosphere and I reinforce the luminous effect of the sun with white. All the colors in the sky and on the hill are colored transitions of depth. Each stroke and color are both the matter and the light. Turning light into matter is perhaps a form of alchemy for painters. Portrait d'arbre. Trees portraiture. I'm interested in visual phenomenon of emergence, expansion, and grounding. Trees are perfect subjects. I pursue their inner volume and density of branches, and I imagine the tree's interiority. In their unique shape, I see trees as visual expressions of the sky to earth relationship. In their elan movement, they are giants or small siblings to me. I am looking at them, deploying their force. I paint them as I would in portraiture. With oil pastels, my gesture and mark making is similar to China marker or charcoal. It is different from painting with oil and brushes as I use pre-mixed buttons of colors. I need to combine them to create color harmony by adding layers, fading with thinner, directly on the surface to always break my colors and preserve volume. The spontaneity of mark making is fundamental as it conveys a more direct relationship with my subject. I am looking for rendering a whole being a presence and an intimacy. Thus, it can only be done with spontaneous and genuine touch. I will adapt this quote from Martin Buber in I and Thou to the first person. I am faced by a form which desires to be made through me into a work. 
This form is no offsprings of my soul, but is an appearance which steps up to it and demands of it the effective power. Aix-en-Provence, Cathedral and Mountain. The central point that I choose to fix my gaze on is the anchor of my motif. It is not necessarily in the exact center. From it, an ordonnance and a choreography are created in my field of vision. The emergence or recession of masses, some lines of forces appear and become essential. In my peripheral vision, elements find their place. I'm sorry if you hear uh, children screaming in the corridor. This sentence by Yves Bonnefoy resonates to me. Does the painter assemble? To the contrary, he learns not to disassemble. Rocks and mountains are also a motif. Compared to us, the mountain is like eternity, looking back in our direction, some fold in time to traverse. La Danussy, Rock de Cher, Steam and Fog. In Annecy near the Alps, I was attracted by the play of light between elements and the quiet giant surrounding the lake. The Roc de Cher, which is this part, this rock, is a very odd cut covered by a dark green forest. Around sunset, the light hits the rock and creates a mesmerizing relationship with water. The vertical cliff stands across the lake facing me as a gate. The sunlight reveals many colors and animates its surface. I use this term with the original Latin meaning of the verb animare, meaning to give life to. I must capture this transient light, it stands on the threshold. Together, strokes of colors give density to the rock and perpetuate the movement of water. The reflection becomes a path. I am also fascinated by extremely ephemeral motifs such as the mist coming off the lake right in front of me. You can imagine my difficulty and how quickly I needed to render this phenomenon. I was moved by the delicate vapor ascending like smoke, filtering the light of a new sun under the sleeping dark water. The columns of mist were dancing in a round. Similarly, I pursued the contrast between mountain and fog and their embrace. Fog and mist are effective agents of unity and they deepen a sense of mystery by quieting down contrast, fusing matter with water and light. Venice. In Venice, it is difficult not to be intoxicated, ecstatic. It is entering a place suspended in time. The beauty of the architecture and its relations to natural element is unmatched. In my drawing, I pursue the character of buildings and churches 
They are massive, and one can feel the uncanny power contained within the walls. A spirituality with an immense beauty, mixed with a somber character particular to Venice history. The beautiful is often bizarre, Baudelaire said. I work with charcoal and china marker on paper. I work quickly as if Venice itself may disappear, but it still dances. Again, its movements visually express patterns of life. Bridges, distances, longing, coming together, all in an encompassing light. The city has many openings towards an infinite horizon with their architecture as the cliffs. Proust wrote, the buildings arranged along either bank of the canal made one think of objects of nature, but of nature which seemed to have created its work with a human imagination. I am particularly interested in pursuing that relationship described by Proust. I perceive Venice as one possible uh, expression of human reconciliation with nature through art. The different versions of the same motifs show how unique each morning is and the evolution of my paintings. I will show a series. I use the photographs as a mean to show you the great variety of sunrises and their unique dramatic tone. They are taken just before I start to mix my palette and to paint. I stand on a little dock where I have enough room to work comfortably. I paint looking straight in the direction of the sun rising, which again is quite difficult as the light to dark relationships immediately shift when the sun is above. San Giorgio stands at the right distance from me so I can envelop it with sky and water. I am fascinated by the balance between the vertical campanile, the tower of San Giorgio and the series of humble elongated building on its right. I see in this configuration another grouping of characters. The campanile and white wall of the church visually create a strong sky to ground and water relationship. It expresses its elan, its vertical momentum, something about our own elevation as beings. The group of buildings are much shorter and almost giving ground so this tall figure can rise. The light, dramatic or quiet during sunrise or sunset, embraces everything with a poignant superposition of layers of time. The water and atmosphere create a visual unity. Venice is a city which makes one's eyes more round.
the cyclical movement of the days, the rolling water, my repeated visit throughout the years, enable me to experience strongly what Van Gogh described as ce qui ne passe pas dans ce qui passe, what does not pass in what is passing. The sensation of eternity can almost be reached in the repetition of painting the same motifs. I am convinced that there is still so much mystery between us and the world. It's one of the reasons why I paint and draw. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Pauline. Do a little round of applause. <laughs> I know it's hard on Zoom when we're all muted, but thank you so much, Pauline. That was so beautiful. Thank um, you. Yay. I'm going to try to go <laughs> back up to this. Up là, voilà. So we can go, go back to any slide or anything if you have a question or... Yes, and I can help field questions. So if someone wants to or comments too. If you want to say anything, feel free to just go ahead and unmute yourself and um, you can put your hand up sort of like toward the screen like this, or you can just go ahead and, and start talking depending on how many people want to talk at once. <laughs> um, no. Oh, this is so great, Pauline. Um, I have a quick question. I'm so interested, especially when you were talking about Venice and how you've mm -hmm. gone year after year after year. Are these paintings from all one year or are they from different years? And how has going year after year sort of affected um, how you're painting and how, I guess, how satisfied you are with your paintings as well? Do you feel oh. like you're the, the, you know, more you go, your paintings get better and better each year? Or are there some where you look back from, you know, five or six years ago and you say, wait, that was really good you know how does the the repetition affect your painting it affected um a lot because hopefully i grow um as uh, an artist and maybe i can um also just briefly show you through the just as a quick shot with um the website um mm -hmm. when we go to venice i mean there is an incredible amount and you can see the um, the cohesion, actually, of my work based on the years. It's like I'm changing every time. And uh, mm -hmm. I feel like recently I'm trying to fuse a lot more drawing and painting together. Um, and, you know, the challenge with it is always for me to make sure that I am painting, you know, what I see in terms of the architecture, the movement with the atmosphere, and to never, you know, attach myself to rendering um, something that would be um, too, you know, il illustrative. I don't need that. But mm -hmm. I'm always um, intrigued by, you know, what I come home with. And I actually need yours to realize what I've painted and the progress I've made um, or not. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's also why having a group of artists you know and friends um helpful is because we have you know a group conversation um right voila so that's kind of you know giving you we are going back in time progressively mm -hmm. that, that's how i sort of you know conceived of it and so much stronger than others um but that's just kind of giving you an idea this is a little bit more how i started it with um, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm sure that some, there may be things that are really interested in the beginning and that I still need to pursue, but it's kind of an evolution. Wow, that's so cool to see them all in order like that. Karen, do you have a question? You'll just have to go ahead and unmute yourself there. I'll there just go. say um, I've enjoyed your presentation. Thank you very much for sharing. And with the Venice paintings, it has like your later works, I felt like there's such a um, circularity and uh, the, 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 the grounding, if you will, is, isn't in the 
you know, isn't just the normal kind of in the bottom of the painting or something, you know, there's a, there's a, there's the focus kind of in the center. And it's interesting when you were scrolling up, it seemed like your beginning painting started that way and your ending paintings. And there was a period in the middle where it seemed to be a little more um, yep. grounded in this ground on the bottom part and you know kind of more what we're taught or learn or what we have learned somewhere along the way some some you know not at the um Marchut school but at uh you know there's there's this foundation there's the sky there's the ground there's the sky but there's a circularity which is really quite beautiful in your more recent paintings but it's really nice to see that you started that way as well Yes, if, I, if that makes any sense, it does make sense, and it's something that happens in Venice. Literally, I mean, uh, I believe that painter, you know, went to Venice, and we are, you know, uh, as artists going to Venice uh, because that's the natural phenomenon that happens. The union between, you know, the color of the sky and the reflection with water, this whole atmosphere uh, makes um, one. I'm more concentric. I mean, mm -hmm. it is concentric, but we perceive we pursue that concentric vision a lot more. This is also the way our eyes naturally operate, actually. Mm -hmm. Well, it's beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Who else has a question or a oh, comment? Yeah, so, go ahead, Cindy. Hi, my name is Cindy and um very gave me the Zoom link. I'm a professor at EMU in Harrisonburg, Virginia. So I'm so happy to be joining. And um, and I do teach painting. And I've been so intrigued with your words as well as your work, the way you describe them is as beautiful as the images themselves. And I really appreciate that. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you so um, much. Oh, absolutely. So I'm, I'm very curious because at the beginning, I heard you talking about spending a lot of time looking and drawing what you see and being immersed in nature in a way that is very observant. And then I notice in your work, you're talking uh, and, and incorporating that what you see is influencing who you are and how you then use the rhythms and and all the logic of nature and create a piece that is so, so intuitive. Um, so how, hmm, how do you, how do you do that? No, I don't know what the question is exactly, <laughs> so, but what is the relationship between that learning to draw what you see and then finding your specific artistic voice? Well, that is an excellent question. And, you know, there is, no formula or recipe in terms of that. And by that, I refer also to Cezanne, um, you know, whose um, incredible development as an artist came to his contact with great works of art, but mostly also nature. And uh, I would say that looking into nature and its great variety and what you know, Leo Marshalls was teaching his student what the school is teaching is to open up to the possibility that there is a little bit more than maybe our preconceived ideas. For example, a tree is not green. There is purple, there is red, there is, you know, orange, there are so many colors. And actually, it's some sort of sharpening one's vision into a complexity of um the quality of nature but at the same time it's not about rendering in a, a naturalistic way what i see but it's more a communication and a constant back and forth meaning that nature and its incredible uh richness as well as art actually allows me to see things with greater depth and then it affects me on a, almost on a cognitive level from my eyes, my perception, because it affects my conception of things. So then I can go back and forth and also realizes 
that um i mean delacroix said um sacrifice is the first uh law of art and in that there is an immense um world to to engage with what does it mean to sacrifice something what does it mean to follow what the work needs rather than oh i'm going to paint this like that because i think it should be painted like that so there is constantly a relationship of um of something mysterious and like i try to explain and Leo Marshall said it, you know, you can think before you paint, you can think after you paint, but you don't think why you paint because it's um, something that is being expressed visually. And it's a necessity. Sometimes, you know, I don't think, but I'm like, darn, it needs a blue, boom, blue. Yeah, you put that really well. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello? O'Neill, do you have a question? Oh, Alan, I think O'Neill beat you out. <laughs> All right. <laughs> O'Neill, you go first. Sorry, Alan. Um, <laughs> wow, beautiful, Pauline. Uh, I wonder, um, one thing uh, that has, it seems like, complemented and expanded your painting practice is also your teaching practice. Uh, you've done a bit of teaching <laughs> in your mm -hmm. time. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what some of the big lessons that you feel like actually working with students led you. Because I know from having spent a lot of time with you that you uh, you actually are listening to your students almost just as much as they end up listening to you and and you learn a lot from them. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit. I, I hate to put you on the spot, but it's, um I wonder if you could talk about a little bit about just like what are some of the things that you feel like are major things that just working with students has has brought your practice uh or your vision maybe is a better way of saying uh, that first it's absolutely incredible to um work with people um and you know beginners or curious experts um, but beginners are really interesting also because um, they don't know what a mistake is. Um, so they make mistake, as you would say um, yourself, when you all. And so sometimes um, beginner students, are, they are trying to understand what they actually see and also to make it manifest on the surface really allows me to be a distance observer of um the development of the creation of volume and depth and light it's really something um incredible to witness the time when a student start to be like ah i'm working on the whole of my surface and there's a luminous effect that is you know coming from the the inside out and that of the painting um it's very much learning how to not impose oneself and how to guide. And as you know, Marshall said also himself, himself, it's it's never telling students or people how to do things, but pointing out maybe when it doesn't work and try to talk about that. So um during my interaction, uh, with my students, I tend to see their growth and their deepening of their vision. And I am extremely lucky of witnessing when they bring something to life on their own surface. And it's like, oh my God, this person has to stop. It's incredible. So it's an extremely... Um, um, it's an extreme privilege to be able to to witness that that growth um if if i am answering or starting to answer your question o'neill i can continue but alan did you have a question now you're on mute now there you go so Pauline, 
Am I on? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. That image there, because you were talking, you talked a lot about the complexity of nature. Mm -hmm. One thing I find interesting in, say, this image that's just in front of us here, when you go back and compare it to the earlier, very first paintings that you did in Venice, um, yeah. one thing that I see in this, if I just take in the strokes, for example, the strokes of color, mm -hmm. and I take strokes of color, uh, no, you can take that away. I just want to look at the painting that's up there. Yeah. The the one, the big one there. It's very, I would use the word complex in terms of how the strokes of color are on the surface. But then there's a relief, I find, in terms of the white of the surface that seems to imply simplicity. I don't know if that makes sense, but the major masses that are or or white surface seem uh, there's a certain simplicity in the way they operate and the way that you've created them through the complexity of the color of the strokes. And I'm just wondering if that uh, you know the subject is you know the white of the surface and how you're using that. But that's one thing I find really beautiful in your work that the the strokes are very complex. If you go through, there's a lot of complexity in all of the different ways that you're using the strokes. But when you get to the major masses of the white of the surface, the big vertical in the sky there in relation to the kind of horizontal light that's in the water is a very simple relationship. Does that enter into how you're trying to work? That's one question. And then the other, just second question is, I see that your red sunrise i think it was sunrise painting you yes. said was done from your imagination is that correct that you did it from your imagination that one i did i did tell you that because what happened is that i arrived a dash late and that particular sunrise was two minutes right. and then the color faded away and i was upset so i was like i will do you anyway by memory so okay. Yeah, this one is from memory. That would be a whole conversation that we could have about how your memory painting, your imagine it, how your imagine your memory painting relates to how you are um, operating when you're looking directly at nature. Because there's something really powerful in this imagination painting, I think which has a relationship to how you work in front of nature. But anyway, that's my two questions. No, I think this is great, um, Alan, that you pointed out this in particular, because it has to do with sacrifices. And, you know, how with my memory, I am seized by something. That's what I was trying to express in terms of when I talk about my motif, I'm first seized by an imprint of, um, you know, forms and movement and you know forces something that is you know profound in terms of how things are but actually it's pretty simple it's simple once it go through the filter of um getting to the essential when i when i look at a motif and i am touched by it very quickly it means that i see something that continue to reveal itself and to reveal itself the more i look and if I do not get distracted by wanting to make an object the way it is, if I don't get distracted by appearances and I keep focusing on um, the fundamental uh, motive, the fundamental things that drove me to paint it, because it's always associated with me, I think, with something pretty emotional, um, then maybe I can um, succeed in, in, in being both very s simple in my work, yet articulating something um, that exists um, in the heart of paradoxes, if I can make sense of that. So, for instance, in this painting, you've got the water, the light, the light in the water is the white surface, yes? Yes. 
And then up in the sky, you've got that big, you've got several lights up above, but you've got a big circle of light. Would you say that when you started this painting, you knew that you were going to use the surface, the white surface of the canvas? Or did you get to this point in your painting and say, oh, I'm not going to paint in anything where that white light is because it's work. You see what I mean? Was it a when you when you started, did you know you were going to use the light of the surface like that? Or did it just at the end, you saw it and said, oh, I'm going to stop now? No, I start with it now. That's one of the big lessons. I feel like I I'm like, OK, if I want to make something extremely luminous, it means that white of the surface is the brightest element. It's the brightest part and I need to preserve it. And that's where the union between drawing and painting comes together. And this sort of primordial light is really important to not um, to not kill. So uh, from the start, I, I mean, I don't know where I started with this. Uh, I, I can't remember, but I knew that there was an intensity. But then, of course, there's the white of the surface but it is brought up to life by the other colors. So that's always something that I'm, you know, extremely intrigued with is the way, you know, th this light here is certainly very light also because there's a great dark next to it. And even this corner right here is really interesting. These elements and how some of these strokes are really holding the world together. There's a few like this also is, it's not something that I um, that I think as I'm painting because I'm not using words, but it's something that must be there. And if I fail to do that, then I, you know, my painting is not as good. Thank you. You're welcome. Who else has a question or a comment for Pauline? It's so nice to see so many familiar faces and names on here. This is so fun, like a little reunion. <laughs> I know. Hello, everyone. Good to see everyone. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Hi. Um, I just wanted to say, um, Pauline, I loved meeting you at the Philadelphia um art talks and it's been so wonderful to see your work it's fantastic so thank you so much thank you thank you Rachel thank you beautiful well we are reaching the end of the hour so this might just be a good place to um to sign off unless anyone has last comments or questions you Wait. can go ahead and shout Karen it out had a John. question there Oh, Karen, did you have oh, a question? Oh, I can ask her questions whenever I want. Um, <laughs> you have that privilege. <laughs> well, I um, you also mentioned somewhere, and again, it's beautiful work. Thank you for sharing, and I'm and I'm glad to be a part of. Uh, you know, this is my first time uh, in this um, group, so I'm so happy to be here. But I, you mentioned the music. Your the music helps and. You know, and I find that true sometimes um, with me too. But uh, so could you say a little more about that? Like, um, is there a specific kind of music that you prefer? Does it change depending on the mood? Or how how, how does that work for you, the, the music? Um, it changes a lot. Um, and it can be very beautiful um pieces of classical music. Um, Goreki is a composer that really, really moves me, or the, the Prokofiev, uh, the Romeo and Juliet. But I also paint on Daft Punk, a live concert, 1997, I think, and or um, in a very curious way also, I did this painting listening to MF Doom, so um, th there is an a great variety, 
but it's always some uh, music that I know will get me in the zone and there's some sort of a pulsing through the music and as the music expand in my imagination and in my memory of the music, I know that there is a sense of volume that is happening and it's a dance and so then I get sort of in tune between the pulse of the music the climaxes, and sometimes I use a sense of rapidity in terms of the stroke, the clack, 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 something very quick that really um, helped me to con conserve, to preserve a sense of volume. I don't know if that makes sense. Because my hands move fast, uh, or a little bit like in, in, in this one, for example, uh, when I say that I'm fencing, it's uh, I look absolutely silly, um, but it's part of the process. It means that there is something that is starting, you know, to be in a rhythm in my hand, and pam 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 pam. I just it's it follows a natural movement. It's really strange, but I cannot not do it. It's um, it allows me also to not be in my head, but to be in the rhythm with things. Mm, that makes Does that sense. Make sense. Yeah, it makes sense to me. <laughs> yeah, and I I like the I thought of the volume too, the music, the volume, the volume of the painting, the volume of the strokes. You know, it's interesting because music is an abstract form, and painting, you know, in this realm is a little bit, well, it's intuitive, which is kind of abstract you know even if it's related to nature um so it 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 I, I think it's beautiful yes thank you yes the the form of abstraction that i think arise in my work and at least i hope are abstraction full of sensations that is really important for me it's to um not detach myself um, from the world that I'm trying to create because as re remaining connected to something um, that I can perceive concretely through my senses, whether it is a tree, you know, the flowers, the sunrise, but something that has a little bit of a reference to my own experience as uh, a you know, a, mort a mortal, um, there is something very poignant and very um, going at the essential. The abstraction is a mean to go at the essential and not to be distracted by a commentary uh, image, if you want, if if I make sense. But it does not mean that this is not a tree, it's just a vibration the, the really the energy the life forces that I see arising or that I see fading and uh, I tell myself a lot of stories you know when I paint it's just um but it's it's it, it's there Johanna do you have a question um not so much a question uh, I just I'm really I love I love seeing this I I jumped on the call late uh, and I'm so sad that I had to be late, but um, but I'm always just continually impressed with how well, um, how well Pauline, you are able to express and articulate your relationship with yourself, your relationship with your art, and your art's relationship with the environment, as well as the time that that all took place and the matrix of all of those things combined. Um, and I think it really shows through in your art and it's always the thing that's blown me away there. That's that's that I, that I love the most. Um, I just, I, I wanted to say that I, I thought that what I caught of this presentation really showcased that. And it's, it's a, and it really, um, it's just wonderful. So thank you for letting me, you know, jump in and see your work thank you so much joe thank you it's it's an honor thank you hey pauline i haven't seen you since 2016 it's carol hi carol <laughs> hi it's so good to see you took me for tea the last night before i left it's good to see you yes joanna articulated everything i wanted to say but I also wondered, I was trying to take notes because I loved your, your what you were saying. Could I get, is there a possible for us to get a copy of that? 
yes i i yes i will send uh, a copy uh to rose or i yes or okay i can send yeah you a copy yes definitely okay you can send it to me and i can share it with everybody after the call when i follow up perfect thank you it's good to see you you did excellent and i love your work Thank you so much, Carol. Yes, I, I know that I, I wrote a lot of big things um, and it was hard for me not to do so, but I know it's things that needs to sit, sit in a little bit. Um, so yes, I, I will be very happy to share my words. Thank you so much. Can I ask one more question? Please, yes, go Alan. ahead, Alan. So Pauline, you know, over the last couple of months, we, you know, shared around that beautiful article by David Brooks, in which he talked about an antidote to sort of the lack of communication in society these days was to go into museums and look at great paintings. And I know that you're a very political person, too. We've had lots of conversations. Could How would you articulate, if you can, a little bit, do you think that what you're doing actually has a relationship to the way that we're living in the world today in relation to the breakdown in communication between people that we seem to be living, especially accentuated after the COVID thing and all of just everything that's going on in terms of communication between uh, groups. Yes, um, I can talk about it. And in the way I conceive of it, and when you say political or how I re really uh, relate myself to it is in the great sense, in the rich sense of the term, finding uh, one's society. position in society. I mean, but it's true because it helps um, to transcend actually um, certain uh, divergence of point of view and connect back to a common mission. In a society when we are all living together, there is, I believe, a need of a finding means to create a dialogue, relationships, and acknowledge and listening. This is something extremely important to me as I need to continue to learn how to listen better. But in terms of art and looking at a work of art and just standing in front of it in museums or looking at, you know, someone's painting, allowing oneself to open up to the reality of the work offers much more possibility for a conversation and negotiation, quote unquote. But in terms of the painting, a conversation, which means not imposing one's look, but letting the, the work express and resonate uh, in us a certain, um, a certain meaning. I would say that pursuing this kind of um, genuine relationship and trying not to impose, but trying to understand what something is maybe trying to say is a healthier way to preserve the connection amongst our communities at large. I firmly believe that ostracizing each other and not communicating, even if it's hard, um, is a dead end. It's an incredible effort, but I think this effort, in this effort resides our humanity. And I am afraid that our humanity is um, challenged or disappearing when we do not maintain um, an ability to listen, really listen carefully what the other have to say, because again, we share so much more in common. We are all on the same boat, whether we want it or not. And um, there is an incredible virtue in maintaining constantly a dialogue. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yes, it does. Beautiful. Love it.
I, ju I just want to add, Pauline, it makes great sense. And there's so much wisdom in that as we talk about our, our interaction with each other and the way that art can actually enhance that interaction and that resonance. So thank you for that. I want to talk to you more about that this summer. With pleasure, with great pleasure. Any other questions or comments before we wrap up here? Hi, Pauline. <laughs> it was so good to hear you talk. I haven't seen you guys and I guess since like 2021 Alan and O'Neill and John but it was lovely hearing everything I don't think I've ever picked up a paintbrush since I left more shoots without thinking about everything you guys said to me and so I especially loved like your portion when you're saying you witness your students and your peers who are painting like when they have brought something to life and witnessed the whole of it all. And it was lovely being on here and just re-hearing so much of what has influenced my painting and my time with you guys. And it was all so lovely. And so thank you for that. You're so welcome, Olivia. Thank you so much. It's good to see you. It's good to see you all. Thank you so much. I know, so fun. Well, let's do one more sort of, I guess, silent I round of applause for dear Pauline. Thank you so much, Pauline, for taking the time to put together such a beautiful presentation and sharing your images with us. It's been so fun to get a peek inside your process and all your work. Um, and I'll follow up with all of you with a link to the recording and um, feel free to share it with your friends and your networks. Um, and thank you all so much for taking the time to join us today. It's so good to see so many familiar faces and people I haven't seen in a long time. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and stay in touch, all of you. <laughs> thank you, you so much for coming and listening. And thank you, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Is it Fabulous as usual. <laughs> thank Beautiful. You. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Rose, are we going to stay on or do another? <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll do a different one, Alan. Okay. I'm just reading the um, comments. Yes, I know. I'm just keeping this open in case anyone wanted to stick around and say, hey. I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and stop the recording, though. How about I do that? <laughs>